just did. I feel so far away if I'm back here. Um, I never use this, but I asked for it this morning because I wanted to uh, be able to see some of my notes and just uh, communicate to you this morning uh, what I believe the Lord's laid on my heart. And uh, hey, I'm Pastor Nate, if you don't know. So glad to have you this morning. And I'm honored to stand in this place and um, and and just pour out uh, what the Lord's poured into me. So let's just come to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for today. Thank you for bringing us here. Thank you for drawing us here, for ordering our steps. Lord, thank you for putting us in relationships here. Uh, and thank you this morning. We just ask you, and I just ask you, Lord, lay our hearts open before you and do a work. Um, Thank you that we are, this morning, as we behold your word, changed uh, to look more and more like you uh, so that we would be um, what this world needs to see. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, sometimes it's not even that the world needs to see him. We need to see him. And I love when, we're, when, when he's displayed in and through us. So, um, you know, so we're, we've been talking a lot out of this passage in 1 John chapter 4, and, uh, you know... I remember uh, Pastor Mark Hankins, he's talking about how Brother Hagin would always teach on faith, and he thought, man, I feel like he doesn't have any more sermons, um, but he realized uh, after it was because he hadn't got it yet, and I think there's some things here that we haven't got yet, um, and so we're going to, we're hanging, uh, hanging in here for a little while. Uh, I believe that there's some things that the Lord wants to get in order in our lives, um, and, and some understanding in which the times in which we live, um, uh, we're not to be moving uh, necessarily from, uh, I, there's not a release to move from this right now. And that's the best way I can ex explain it. Every time uh, in my heart I'm like, uh, I think, oh, well, maybe I should go on because I've already, nope, it's like there's more here. So first, uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with me. And we're actually starting a new series today um, called Independent. Uh, independent. I thought I was going to get to this about four weeks ago, but here I am right now. And even this morning, or not this morning, but in this uh, over the last week, uh, when I thought I was going to talk about independence or in Christ, what we are in Christ, um, I came to I come, came to realize that the Lord wanted to talk to us about Him in us, not us in Him. And so there's things about how in Him, like in Him, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. In Him, it's about our position in Christ. And because of our position in Christ, because of what Christ has done, there's, and there, we, it does need to be taught, all right? There are, there are things that what Christ has done has positioned us, has raised us up to be seated in heavenly places, uh, has wiped away the, the, the past sins, and, 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 oh, wow, there's so much. And because of we're the righteousness of God, we have favor. Because of, you know, you can look at all this position, but Christ in us is Christ in us for a purpose. So it, 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 the Christ in us is not about position, it is about application for us here in this world. It's the, the ability to testify, the ability to testify Christ in us, that we would be the walking and living display of who he is here on this earth, all right? So 1 John chapter 4, 1 through 4, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. And I, even though we're jumping into a, a, a new, a new uh, topic, more or less, uh, here, really highlighting on verse 4, I think it's, it's pertinent for us to still bring back up the, 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 the foundation that we've laid um, about do not believe every spirit or every breath or every, every voice that's in this world. Um, because they all, they, they have different authors. They have different authors, and the authors have different intentions. He says, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit. See whether they are from God. For many false uh, prophets have gone into the world, uh, but by this you will know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This, now listen closely, this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and which is already in the world at this time. I want to stop and I want to highlight something about Christ and Antichrist. The word Christ would be, it's not Jesus' last name. 
it would be uh, the anointing or the anointed one, all right? So Christ, or then there's also that would be Antichrist. And so a lot of times what we do is we formulate this, this picture of, of maybe good and bad. How many of you would say Christ? You're like, okay, good, you know. And then Antichrist, you're like, oh, blatant evil, right? Let me define anti for you. Uh, and one of the words, that because it's Antichrist, it's actually two pieces, okay? And Antichrist simply means to re- anti- replace. That doesn't sound so bad, does it? Replace, to replace. Think about this. Think about this. Antichrist, just to simply replace Christ. Oh, man, that, I mean, hey, you want a chocolate cookie? You know, think about this. And this is happening this happens with babies and baby Christians all the time. People that, uh, that when we, we get born again, but a different voice begins to speak, Antichrist, and they replace something that was given to us. How many of you know when they no longer make that thing and they replace it with this, it's never as good as the original? How many know what I'm talking about? It's just not. But, but here's what happens, and we don't even realize it. If you try to take a cookie from a baby, it's not going to be good. But... But if you take that chocolate chip cookie and you replace it with a sugar cookie, ah, okay. Come on. Anti Christ. Replace Christ. I'm telling you, there is there are breaths that are breathing in this world, and they're simply replacing it. Just replacing them. So we don't, you know what we don't do? We don't put up a fight. And so there, look, look at the next verse though. He says, you little children are from God and, and, you're, and have overcome them or the, these voices, these that would, this, this voice that would, again, it's not people. It's, it's talking about the war of the worlds. And that's the title of this morning's message, War of Worlds. Independence, War of Worlds, Independent is the series, Independence, not Independence, Independent. And uh, he goes, he says, because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The, 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 who's in you is greater. What he's spoken is greater than that which would speak in the world. And what happens is, and even in this time, we are fighting for independence instead of from independence. Listen, even as the church, we should be fighting from a place of freedom, not a place of being confined, fighting for freedom. No, we should be fighting from a place of freedom. But, uh, but I'm telling you, even what is being fought for is, is being silenced and being, um, and being hindered because uh, of, of this, these words that are spoken uh, about you and me and the Word of God about relative, about, uh, and we're going to look at this this morning. We're going to look at some, something uh, here, here in just a moment, and I want you to see it uh, and how prevalent it is. And I believe there will just be a light bulb going off uh, on the inside uh, and, and, and how vital it is for you and I to, to, to carry a message or to understand that the message and the spirit that's in us can't stay there. It's in us, but it has to get outside of us. And the words that are spoken from here or in a church can't, and, and by the church can't remain in walls. they got to be carried beyond the four walls into our world, into our workplace, into our homes. They got to replace, okay? They got to replace what has replaced Christ. They got to put back Christ in, in in his place, the right place, the first place. And I said this a little, uh, and I really didn't hit on. I'm not going to hit on it long this morning, but I think it's important. And I think even in America, we have this idea of, and we live so much in. I don't know if you call it a republic or a democracy. You know, people are like it's not that; it's this. Listen, in other words, you're voting. <laughs> Like you have a vote, okay? So what it's not is uh, where you have a king. But did you know the kingdom of heaven is you don't get a vote. So I think sometimes in, in America especially and in, in, in the, the America allied world, England, okay? 
They're, they're voting for who's going to run. They're, everyone has, a, they get to cast a ballot. They get to cast their vote. We, we, we've taken that, because of what we live in, we take that, take that same thing and we apply it, right, to even in our church. It just happens. Well, I just don't, I just don't like that part. I don't, I'm not going to go with that part. We do that with our kids, too. Hey, what do you want for dinner? Like, you get a vote. Like, you don't get a vote. You're going you're gonna to eat. The only person that gets a vote is your wife when you try to take them out to eat, and they don't want to. Right? You know, I don't want to vote about that. All right, okay, let's keep going. So, anyway, so, we, you know, replacement doesn't sound that bad. We're talking, again, about greater is he that's in you, and that's this word. The word greater is mega. Hey, megas in the Greek. That's where we get the word mega. Like, that's how much, it's not just big. It's not just greater. It's mega, like there's not even a size comparison to he that's in you. And he's able to stand. If you, if you and I would put him, on, put him out there, he's able to stand. Okay? Um, uh, so here we go. All right. So turn with me to 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Boom. First Corinthians, or excuse me, Second Corinthians ten five. I think I said First Corinthians. Did you know um, words that are allowed to stand are allowed to shape? And we'll get to this here a little bit, a little bit more, even in how we see culture today. Okay, words that are allowed to stand or remain or are not fight for are allowed to shape. Or and and we see in the Bible that words not only create. Okay. Um, uh, uh, create a course, but they also create a culture. They create um, an environment. How many of you know your words can create an environment? Real quick, just talk about dinner at the dinner table and how is this, right? How many of you know your words can create a culture pretty quick, just in a moment, but they also create a course where you see uh, God sent John the Baptist filled with the Spirit, right? This is the spirit, the spirit of God, the spirit of truth to, to do what? To make straight, the Bible says in John 1, 2, 3. I love it, John 1, 23. Uh, he said, I'm a voice of one calling in the wilderness, making straight the way of the Lord. He was sent there to prepare a way in the wilderness, a highway, uh, the one translation says, and Isaiah says, a road for Jesus Christ to walk on. So words, they create a culture, but they also create a course. And so this is why it's says in 2 Corinthians 10 5 it tells us that we are to demolish uh, uh, arguments and every pretentious uh, or pretension pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take uh, uh, captive every thought to make it obedient to somebody say to to Christ to, so, so how many of you know, it's easy to know, here's what he says, uh, against the knowledge of God, it's easy to know about God, and it's easy to let words be spoken, or, or a culture created, or a course laid out in front of us, and know about God, but say nothing, and not say what Christ says about it. And when I don't say what Christ says about the situation, I'm talking about, I'm not just talking about you saying, well, be righteous, And sin, I'm talking about what Christ says about the situation. What does he say about your healing? What does he say about your finances? What does he say about your family? What does he say about your marriage? What does he say about everything? This is what he's talking about. We, a lot of times, hear about the knowledge of God, and even what we know, we we no longer uh, uh, fight for what God says, and we allow a different word to replace it. And when it's replaced, we now come underneath that authority. Or we now come, let me say this, we now, are, we now allow that culture to persist in our homes, the culture of lack. Because you're just going to let it come every month and you're just going to say what the bills say. You're going to say what everybody else says. You're going to say instead of what Christ says, even though you know or you once knew. You know, I think even right now there's this, sometimes, I think in the natural, um, uh, we, had, we have a rent house and we were, we were trying to get, uh, we had a rent house and I, I was going to build some houses and the Lord just got a hold of me and said, is that what I asked you to do? And, and, and long story short, it's taken me almost a year to get everything uh, fine, 
bank-wise, this, that, clean back up to release what I started on my own. And I'm so thankful because of even the time in which we live and, and this time, that how much of a distraction some of these other things would have been. I didn't see it at the time. But the Lord grabbed, grabbed a hold of me, and I can tell you my attention has been fixed where it needed to be, and I haven't been distracted, and I'm so thankful to the Lord. But even in that time, there was this thought, okay, that I got to get this sold before the elections. And I've said it multiple times. And so there's this thought that we got to get, uh, and maybe even this perception in, in, our, in America and in the world that like, like there's a lot of things going on. How many of you have had that perception? Maybe just maybe I'm the only one. Everybody else is anybody else awake or asleep this morning? Because you know, praise the Lord. But there's this perception of like maybe uncertainty. What should we do? Should we do this? Should we do that? And and um, and you know, you hear a lot of people say, "Well, I just want to get my finances in order." Get this. You know what? We need to get in order. What we believe. This is why we're putting Bible school back in its place. We, we actually had Bible school before, and we moved Bible school, which was once called Next Level, okay? And we moved that into our Wednesday night format. Uh, and, the, and since we've come back, we put worship back in, and we just have midweek service. And we said, you know, it's, there's not, it's not enough. It's not enough uh, output of the Word, an opportunity for people to grow and, and, and for us to be sharpened, because we need to be sharpened in this day. What we need to get in order is what we believe and why and how we believe what we believe. We need to get that in order because what's happened is there's been, a, there's been some things replaced that, that don't add up or that don't fit, and we wonder what, what, why the frustration is. I, I taught a message years back here uh, in about a box, you know, and how you, there's so many precious things, right? And there are light bulbs, and it's like, oh, this lights up my life, and oh, this is so special. It lights up my life, you know, hunting and sports and family and this and that. And, and then we have this 24 hours, and then God, oh, yeah, God. And, and, and he's good, too, you know. And I oh, couldn't do life without him. And we begin to say, yeah, hunting. And we, put, we fill our, our box of our 24 hours of a day, and, and we... And we try to cram it in there. And it was so cool because I put it in there and I pushed it down to get it all in there because we were trying so hard. And the one that broke was the one that I was hoping would. And it did. And it was God. It was left in pieces. But guess what? We got all the other things in our place. But if we don't have that one in place, everything's out of order and nothing works right. And we are, we are allowing a replacement theology or allowing a new way of thinking that has replaced what Christ said and now you and I are left to our own understanding that's a dangerous place because we see about this far maybe maybe this far the Bible says that the wisdom the, the, the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men so we need to take our, we need to take thoughts and we need to take words that, that are, are put out there and we need to take them and we need to bring them to, uh, to the obedience of the knowledge of Christ. The knowledge of God, we need to bring them uh, and make them obedient to Christ. Why? Because words that are allowed to stand are allowed to shape. Because words create course, but they also create culture. Let me say it this way. You could say it like this. If you want to implement a plan, just let the word, the words stand. I know I like to rhyme, but sometimes it sticks, okay? If you want to implement a plan, just let those words stand. Just let them stand. Like, we're going to go to, after church, we're going to go to get ice cream at Andy's. Guess what you're going to probably be doing? Because if they're not warred by, if mama says it and daddy doesn't say something about it or vice versa, guess, guess what the kids say is going to happen? We're going to Andy's. And guess where you're going? We're going, that's right. Because, because you let the word stand. You didn't say no, you, you, you allowed it. So any word that we let stand will bring about that plan. The enemy has a lot of words going forth. And the whole goal is to bring about a plan. Any word, I'll say it again, any word that's allowed to left, uh, to be, to, to left stay standing, to allowed to be unanswered, will carry out its plan. Think about that. 
Think about that. Um, let's keep on going here. Oh, it's so good. So we know that culture is created. You know, we could create a culture, even in a church. You know, you think about workplace culture. You think about family culture. It's created. There's families, the culture, you maybe grew up in a family culture that was like, ha, ha, ha. And then you married into somebody that's like, how many of you know? How many of you know? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, you know, how many of you know that if you, marry, you bring two cultures together, they collide, you have a new culture, right? That happens. And, and so you have a mix of culture. And you know there's a, there's a mix of culture even, even in America. There's a mix. There's a mix of culture in churches. There's a mix of culture in homes. There's a mix of culture in businesses. And you have the choice to, to determine which culture, because they are created, that you allow to stand. You can have a culture. You could have came from a culture of anger and, re, and a place where you just blew your lid and just cuss, 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 cuss. Every time you got upset, cuss, 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 cuss. And, 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 and the, the other family could have came from a family that's filled with abuse. Okay? And so now you're married. So now you got cussing and abusing when somebody doesn't do something right. And now you got a, a culture that has been created to, to conform and to make people fear. Uh, and they, may, they probably don't get out of line too much. The kids might really obey because they, they don't want to pay. They don't want to pay for your, the hellish environment that you've created. Because this is, this is the thing. But you know what? You can choose to create a different culture by the words that you let stand and what you say about yourself. And if you come into agreement with what God says about you instead of how you've always been and how it's always been. And this is the way it's always going to be. You can change the culture if you agree with Christ. Okay, let's keep going here. So, and, and you know, more than a course, uh, you know, more than, uh, uh, you know, you think of uh, the culture, more than a course um, that's allowed to flow, it, it's, it's like a river. Like, culture is like a river. It's more than a course, it's a current. How many of you know, like, culture uh, kind of tells you what to do if you're not firmly footed? Culture will sweep you in uh, and sweep anything in that's not firmly rooted. I, I, I love to hunt, and there's this place that um, it's actually uh, just north of town here, and it's got this creek in the bottom, and uh, it's Little Frog is what the, the creek's name is, Little Frog Bayou, and, and, and so it's this mountain stream, and um, it, it, during hunting season, a lot of times the river or this creek will get high, and it's hard to pass over, but if I get to this one spot that's shallow, right, I can cross it even when, in a sense, the water's up because there's a great fall there and there's this flat rock. But here's the thing about this flat rock where everywhere else is all the boulders everywhere that's so easy to cross. This flat rock is extremely slippery. So when I walk, and let me tell you, I bit it with my gun and everything and, you know, ended up in the drink, gun saved, bow saved, whatever. Um, but I've learned that I got to be able to, when I walk in here, I got to make sure that, I, that when I get that one set, it's footed, it's firm. That I know that where I'm going to stand, will my foot will remain. I got to know what I'm standing on. I got to know, let me say it this way, I got to know what I believe. I got to know what I hold to in this culture, in this current, this strong. Even though it's only this deep, it could take me over that quick because I don't have a firm footing or a firm hold on what I own as a belief. I'll let, I'll let anti-replacement, I'll let, I'll let something else replace what I once held as truth. Culture does that. Let's keep going here. John, um, uh, uh, let's see here. Uh, again, I wrote this down. Christ, uh, Christ has called us to follow, not to flow. <laughs> Think about that. Follow him, not to go with the flow. He's called us to follow him. And so that's, that's a lot of times uh, counter-cultural. John chapter uh, 17, uh, 11, uh, and then comma 15 uh, through 18. This is this, this picture here where Jesus is praying for the disciples. And we quote maybe uh, 17 and 18 where we're in this world, but we're not of this world. And we think the goal is to not be of this world, but that's not the goal. He, say, he, he makes that declaration about us. The goal is that we would go into the world. And I'm not taking, going to take time to go through all he said. I'm no longer, he says, I will no longer be in the world, but they, that's us, are in the world, and I'm coming to you. 
Go to the, the next one. He says, I'm not asking that you take them out of the world. And I'm not asking him that they wouldn't, that they're not of the world. They're not of the world. But I'm asking you, he says, that you keep them from the evil one and that they would be able to go in. Next verse, he says, that they are not of the world, just I am not of the world. Next verse, uh, sanctify them in truth. Next verse, 18. Is, he says, as you sent me into the world, I also send them. This is this whole picture of here about you're in the world, but you're not of the world. The, re, the whole goal about the, uh, the whole thing he's talking about is I'm sending them. He's it's the prayer that they would be able to stand in the world and carry a message. This is the prayer. This is what God's prayer for us is. Jesus himself praying for the disciples, and not just the disciples, but he goes on to say those that come after. That they would be in this world, not of this world, right? They're not of it, but they would, they would be in this world. They would go into this world carrying a message. All right, so the goal is not to be, you know, again, uh, to be of the world, but to carry the message uh, into the world, all right? Um, let's keep going. So talking about culture here. All right, so um, culture is created uh, through suggestion. And, I'm, and this is some science here. It's pretty amazing, pretty interesting how I stumbled upon this here. Um, culture is created, oh, so, and this is what we were talking about earlier, that every breath, test every spirit. That's what he says, test the spirits, John chapter 4. Test them, because everyone doesn't come from God, Okay. And so there are spirits that have an origin that would like to carry out a plan, if you, and, and they will, as long as you let that word stand. This is why we're at where we're at, even in, in our world today, okay? Because uh, anything that's not fought for will not be on a ballot. <laughs> the reason certain things are on ballots and we move a certain way is because somebody suggests and fights for it. And the silent majority is not a majority, that's a lie. The silent majority is not a majority. Everyone in here, we could say, hey, I, uh, I want to get ice cream, okay? But I, I want to make sure I really bless you, and, and I want to know if you would like chocolate or vanilla, right? And, and in here, if the majority likes chocolate, but they're silent, guess what we're getting? So what's the majority? Vanilla. There's no such thing as a silent majority. That's a lie. That's a feel-good lie that tells you you're all right to stay silent. What a lie. That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a way for the enemy to work his plan and for you to let a word stand. Just let it be. Oh, si oh, 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 come on, Pastor Nate. We don't need to listen to this. Okay, there's something called the Overton window, okay, the Overton window. It is the range of policies politically acceptable to the mainstream population at any given time. So this is, this guy presented this idea, and, and they've now named it the Overton, it's called the Overton window, okay. And so it's, it's this acceptable mainstream, the, the, what policies or political policies that are acceptable to the mainstream population at any given time, it's also known as the window of discourse. So the, but this other guy came up with a little bit more, uh, you know, you know, thought or idea around this whole deal. You can go wiki this, this thought, oh, the Overton window, and you can find all kinds of things like the, I think it's called the slam in the door effect, like where if I slam the door or if I do something that just kind of shocks you that you would even ask of that, like you would even say that to me, if I do that, then I can come in with a lower ask and you're more apt to accept it. Because I just shocked you, you're like, no, but then you like, you can slip one in on you. It's called the slam in the door effect. It's, it's, it's the, okay, it's the wardrobe malfunction. Oh, come on, Pastor, I thought you were preaching the word. I am preaching the word. It's the wardrobe malfunction on a Super Bowl that everybody watch and goes, oop, booby. Oh, all that was was suggestion. 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 Oh, you know, that, that's not a good deal. You know, couldn't do that. We're just, it's just suggestion. It's something that is allowed to be. But do you think anybody else turned, tuned into the Super Bowl uh, next year? Sorry. Yeah. They did. With 
okay? So let's keep going here. So here's, I, want, I, I wish I would have given you uh, th- this, uh, this, this, this image here. It's like a timeline. But here's how it works. There is the unthinkable, okay? The unthinkable, there's just this thought or this idea that would be unthinkable. And you're like, oh my gosh, can you believe that you would have sex with children of underage? Oh my gosh, that's just unthinkable. Then what ends up happening, that same idea that was presented, okay, now becomes radical. Oh, you're just radical. You're just way out there. You're just in the ditch over there. It's not unthinkable, but it is radical. And, and so now this thought that, or this plan or this word that is, uh, has, has, has been allowed to left stand is beginning to work its plan. That which is unthinkable is now radical. But what happens is as it stands in the place of being ratified, it now becomes acceptable. So now it's like, well, maybe you were just born with a sexual orientation to want to be with little kids. Like you were just born that way. So then it becomes acceptable. So now it goes on the ballot. And and it'll even go on the ballot when when it's radical because it wants to be ratified. It wants to be agreed with. And if it becomes agreed with, it's acceptable. And once it's acceptable, what happens is it's sensible. That makes sense. Doesn't that make sense? I mean, come on. It's come, I mean, get with, the, get with the program. Like, it's 2020. 2020. You, just, you're, you're, you don't realize it, but you've been, bo- you've been boiling in culture. This is what's been happening. Because, and, and for far too long, the, the message of the church and the words that we've, we, the bigot, you're bigot. Hater, this kind of thing. And we're going to keep on going because I'm not just talking about culture. I'm not just talking about the war. I'm going to talk about application here in, the, in a little bit. But this is super important for us to understand that we would have some ground to stand on, okay? And that we would hold our ground in culture and that we would not only stand our ground, but we would now re- instead release some words. We wouldn't allow certain words to stand, not just in our prayer closet, but in public, and that we would understand how to speak the truth in love and what that really looks like. It doesn't look like being rude, it doesn't, but it does always look like presenting a choice. Love always presents a choice. And what happens is, even in the ballots, there's not, the, like the, the, the Christ views are not present. The replacement views are the one started here um, and, and now this over here. And now we don't stay here. We come here because, well, that might be more, what, acceptable. Well, we have just played into the game and we've come a part of the plan instead of bringing it to the obedience of Christ. Not replacement Christ. Not, not anti-anti-evil Christ. Not replacement Christ either. Christ. What does his word say? What does his word say? Hey, let me ask you, what does his word say? So it, bego- so it goes from unthinkable to radical, from radical to acceptable, from, sens- from, from acceptable to sensible. Yeah, I mean, I can totally see that. Yeah, I mean, I get it, yeah. What, what does he say? The, the, uh, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end leads to the, this destruction. Listen to what it says. Then it goes from sensible to popular popular. And then from popular to policy. Okay? Listen. So a new idea fills the window of what the public regards unthinkable, causing the desired idea to shift into the window that the public views as sensible without its proponents nearly having explained any benefits of the desired idea. So just by putting it out there, it has this natural course that just naturally gets to here without an explanation. It doesn't make any sense. Like nobody's explained this, but it, it, not until it becomes sensible, and now it, it's it, because it's acceptable that you, now it's sensible. Because everybody accepts it. Yeah, that does make sense. Really, let me ask you your 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 view, because and and this might be really uh, faux pas, but I want to seriously ask this question, and because I think it's really healthy for us to identify what we believe. And what we have allowed in, 
And I want to ask you, um, because there, there's certain things, if you were raised in 1900, 1900, you would not remotely think the way that you do today. You would hold the, the word of God on, on a lot of places very strongly. But what has happened is culture has changed, and so now we are the enlightened ones. As wisdom increases, the Bible tells us in the latter days that knowledge will increase. What happens is knowledge puffs up, and it's a setup for a fall. Okay? Satan would love to take you out. So what he wants you to do, he wants to, win, he wants to win the battle in the battle of your mind. And he wins that battle when we don't answer the words that are spoken from anti-Christ with what God has said. And we begin to lead our lives based upon the worldview instead of the biblical view. Instead of what God has designed for us. Wow. But if you, I mean, you could look at... You could look at sexuality in 1900, but you know, and you would say that today, well, that's because everybody was bigots back then. It could be. It could be if I was standing up in the stage, because this is happening in churches, and I was like, you blankety blank, blank. I can cuss. I could cuss from the pulpit today. And, you know, a lot of you guys would not think anything of it because that's just kind of culture culture that's just what we do i mean i mean we watch movies that today 20 years down the road from what i grew up that my mom and dad would say oh we're not watching that why well because it has an f-bomb in it and because it says d and h and you know they use the lord's name in vain now we say oh it's okay we just we just we just roll with the flow as the church. Because culture, we have this thought, let me just, this is, this is important for us. We have this thought that culture's out there. It's, it's out there, you know. The, oh, man, man, culture's getting bad. Okay, let me ask you, because that culture's in your home, and you just put mother effer in your ears, in your house, you just put yourself before watching a guy cheat on his wife and thinking that's okay, and we're watching it as entertainment. Sex in the City, okay? I, I, uh, I was going to watch a show, and you, you might, watch the, might watch this show, not Sex in the City. Um, <laughs> no, not, not that. Um, but this show, uh, it's, it's popular, and you, you're going you're gonna, to, I'm not hating on what you choose. Listen, love always gives the choice, but you've got to realize what you're choosing. There's this show that, that is just like Sex in the City, except for it's more Hallmark, right? How many of you like Hallmark? We watch this, oh, it's horrible, Hallmark. <laughs> but it's good, because it feels good, and for the most part, I, I don't know that there's really a bunch of cussing in it. Like, I don't think there ever is, or, or like... Scenes going and cheating on somebody and sleeping around and like s sexual seduction and all this. But there's this show called, and it's really popular, of course, because it's, it's the clean version of Sex in the City. So I looked it up and that, there was a review on, it's the clean version of Sex in the City. It's the southern, good, feel good, real life version. You know what it is? It's the culture version of Sex in the City that's acceptable in our hometown. And, it, and you want to know what it's called? Anybody want to know what it's called? Because you want, you want me to hammer on you? I'm not hammering on you. I'm just saying there's plenty of language, and they're sitting around drinking their problems away and talking about what's going on and all these kind of things. It's not what the Lord says. Am I saying you can't drink? I'm saying you need to ask the Lord what he says. I'm not saying for you to ask me. That's where the church has gotten off. You ask me? How about you have Jesus as Lord? Like, like even being born again. Here's what I would, I was driving down the road, and the Lord dropped this in my heart to, when, I, to, when you give a salvation call. Because even in the church, do you have Jesus as Lord? Does he hold that place in your life? Or are you Lord? Do you determine what you say? It's called uh, magnolias, sweet magnolias or something like that. 
And I, it's like, uh, uh, it says, oh, great binge, great binge, great binge. I'm like, okay, cool. Look, this would be a great family show. And you're like, okay, you know, I mean, but you know what? That's, it's, it probably is because, you know, we all cuss. It's real life. Dadgummit, it's real life. That's right. It's real life. And that's the way it is. And that's the way it is. And because that's the way it is, that's the way it should be. Really? I thought we were supposed to contend for something here on earth that is as it is in heaven. You want what you're watching, that that's the way it is, to be the norm for your children? No, I really don't want them going through that. Oh, you don't? But what was once unthinkable has now become radical, but we're not even at radical. And I know that this is a very simple, small thing, but it's acceptable. It's not just acceptable. It's not just sensible. It's popular, and it's policy within the church. Salt is losing savor, and we don't even recognize it. Culture. Culture's strong. Culture's very strong. What you believe, listen, and and so even with what you believe, you're saying, come on, get with the program. Hold, you know what's amazing? Listen, the Bible says this about, um, because culture, the culture is not just out there. It's in our homes, it's in our workplace, and it's in our church. It's in our children. Listen, our life is shaped, is it shaped by culture or conviction? Is your life shaped by culture or is it shaped by conviction? Here's one that I, I get tagged for. And, but like even to me, what once was Wednesday night uh, was, was reserved for church. Now there's sports on Wednesday night. What once was Sunday was reserved for family and church. Now we just go travel for tournaments all weekend because family comes first. And we've... we've it, it's not that we've kicked God out. We've just replaced him with family. And when I replace him with family, the very thing that he designed to carry on a culture of kingdom is now kicked him out. And we wonder why our culture begins to move from what was once unthinkable is now uh, uh, not just radical, not just acceptable, not just sensible, but is actually popular. And it is now the policy and the way that we do life, which is so far from what the Word of God says, and we preach things that are so far, okay, we say things as Christians, we don't even know where it's found or what we really believe, and we talk about certain things about grace and this and that to justify how we feel and how we think and the, 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 the view that we hold that was not, never based on a firm foundation it was simply a part of what everybody else was doing and since that's what they were doing we began to do it too and now it's part of our life and so the word of God when the truth comes it can set us free and when the truth comes listen the Holy Spirit was sent for you and me to convict the world of sin I didn't say condemn I said convict, because unless you're convicted, unless you see the truth, unless you see that you need a Savior, listen, unless, that this is why people, uh, even right now, the harvest, uh, it, it seems to, to, to uh, it's ripe, okay, unless people see their need for a Savior, there will be no surrender, Conviction is a work of the Holy Spirit. But you know, conviction never happens without a testimony. Conviction never happens without a testimony. Are you testifying of Christ and the blood of Jesus? Are you testifying of what he says? Or are we, uh, have we so drunk the Kool-Aid of culture that we look no different and we're afraid to say what Christ says and, and we are not willing to love somebody by simply giving them a choice? Because we think speaking the truth is rude. And even what I'm saying right now, and I'm passionate about, I'm not telling you this, and I'm not standing above you. I'm saying, guys, look. Guys, look. 
See, because when we speak the truth about Christ, this is what we need to be speaking. We need to be speaking the truth about Christ. We need to be speaking the truth about culture. We need to be speaking the truth about ourselves. We need to be speaking the truth, and we need to be speaking the truth in our workplace, in our homes. We need to be coming into agreement with what Christ says and not believe or receive every spirit or every voice of anti-replacement Christ that comes our way and begin to walk that way. Way. Because what happens when we and when we speak the truth, we got to learn to speak it in love. You know what part of speaking the truth in love is? This be respectful, honor somebody, value them. Speaking the truth in love, if, if I'm going to do that, it's going to take humility. And so humility, we talk about this, I don't shine it in your eyes, I shine it at your feet, I put it before you. And you know what, everyone's not going to like it, and that's okay. But, I, but love always gives the choice. Love gives the choice. Love, the, if you, you we're, we are created to be salt of the earth, we are the preserving agent of the earth. We are the flavor agent of the earth. I want you to speak the truth, but I want you to speak it like this in mind. I'm laying before somebody a choice. One that's one that's filled with freedom and, and eternal eternity and one that they can build their life on and they can have the things that God designed for them. He said, hey, listen, Satan's come to kill, steal, and destroy. And he does it by replacing replacing purity in marriage by bringing videos and, and, and TV, TV shows and thoughts and, and, and now you have this butterfly feeling in your stomach because it would feel so adventurous to, to, to let certain things in. But what he's doing is he's coming to steal, kill, and destroy and he's replacing what was once celebration of each other and intimacy by allowing other thoughts in the bedroom. Though it gets you off or though you, you together have better uh, sex or whatever it might be. And you know, these, there's kids here that, and I just said this three little words, sex. They hear about sex all the time. They know probably more about sex in today's culture than you do. But there's a script that's written by culture and it's telling you how you're supposed to be, who you're supposed to be, how you're supposed to act. And it's straight from the wrong origin from the wrong spirit. But there is the message, which is the word of God, which, which has never changed. Come on, get with the culture. Listen, the Bible talks about the day in which we live and how the light will grow darker, and, or dark will grow darker and light will grow lighter. There'll be a greater separation. Don't be surprised. But you know what? Love, it has to be present in, in it, when, when truth is presented because otherwise there's no grace. Because otherwise there's no grace. It was the grace, the undeserved gift of God that found me. It's why I'm here today. I didn't think, oh, I want to be a pastor. I thought, about, I thought, man, I could do this, and I could do this, I could make this. And, but it was he found me. I got to tell somebody about his love for me. And, and I knew that what I was doing wasn't okay. Not because... The, and because the voice at that time of the world didn't say, it was still unthinkable. Now, now when I was in fourth grade over at a friend's house watching the Playboy channel, what was unthinkable or, or extreme, like, man, he's going down the wrong track, is now talking to sports moms, well, that's just the norm. That's just what boys do. They just go look at porn all the time. That's just because that's the norm. That's just normal. And because it's normal, it's acceptable. And because it's not just normal, it's not just acceptable, it's celebrated. So, hey, buddy, hop in the truck and let's go to Hooters and look at somebody's. Even though I'm married and I'm going to dishonor my wife, so I'm training you to just become a part of a culture and, and, and have an environment now that you're growing up in, in a life that's going to bring about it destruction. Oh, God. But my plan is that you would, Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But, but my plan is that you would have life and you would have it more abundantly. And he says, hey, um, you're going to have to, but, but, but to have this life, you're going to have to lose yours. And, and he says, you're going to have to take up your cross and follow me because whoever, whoever loses their life, he says, you'll get the life that, that I designed for you that you 
is so satisfying and you're not looking to fill it with other things. You'll, you can have that, but, but you're going to have to surrender or surrender to what he says. Is it easy to surrender and to lay down your life to what he says? No, but is it better and is it worth it? Always. Is joy found in the home and in your marriage and with your children and in your future when you come into agreement with what Christ says? Always. Always. Let's agree with him. Let's go back. Let's go cross-cultural. Let's go back and find out what he has to say and celebrate that and stand in, in, in a sense in the opposition of that which would replace Christ in our homes, in our churches, in our schools. Let's use our voice and not just use it in these walls. Let's, let's be shaped that we go out and somebody would have a choice. They don't even know. They don't even know. We're serving. It's like I was talking to these boys last night there, uh, or my, my, one of my boys, well, two of my boys, Danny and Matt, and, and Danny's an adopted fourth child. And, um, and we were talking about, we were talking about um, cookies and how many times we come in and we grab a chocolate chip one and we're at a bakery and we really don't like that kind, but that's all that we see. And under the counter, is every kind you could ever want or imagine. But nobody's telling anybody. And so everybody's eating the same thing, even though they really want their marriage like this. Even though there's something in their heart that says it doesn't have to be this way. Even though, but they're just taking the stuff. They're just taking the stuff. Because, because nobody is being transparent enough or speaking the truth. That's what, that's what truth is, is transparency. Honesty. Instead, so a friend says something, and you just go, yeah, mm-hmm because I don't want to offend them. So you know what you do? You don't present a choice. So you just leave them in the place where they're going through hell instead of saying, you know, hey, with love. With love looks like this humility. It values them more than yourself. And the only reason I ever hold on to truth and hold on to Christ and don't put it there is because of how I would look, not because of how, how, what they're going through. It's because of me. Not because of how they feel, would feel, but it, what are they going to do to me? How are they going to see me? We got to stand with Christ, for Christ, because he is the hope of the world. Jesus is the hope of the world. What God says. And you know, it's interesting. He talks about how the word of God is like a rock and you can build your life. Even in the storm comes, the house will remain. It won't get swept in with the current. And I could go oh, to all these scriptures. It says, it says that, that the word of God stands forever. The flowers fade, the grip, grass withers, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And I, I was looking in, in, in Revelation, and it, you know, it was interesting. Even at the middle, uh, in the middle of Revelation, God sent an angel. And what he sent an angel with was the same message that was sent 2,000 years ago. It didn't change. Culture hasn't changed it. Culture can't change it because it's going to remain. It says, actually says flesh withers, flowers wither, grass withers. In other words, man's going to change. Man's going to go, but the word of God will remain. It can't be changed. It won't be changed. It is the only thing for salvation. It's what saved then. It's what saved in 1870 uh, to 2021. It's what saves. Today, it's what saves. In the future, it's what saves. During the tribulation, an angel was sent. Look at this. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's 14.6. Then I saw another angel flying in midair. Talking about that last week. Open our eyes to the reality. Oh, God. And he had the eternal gospel. The eternal, unchanging gospel. Good news. Guys, I got some good news. Speaking the truth with rage and anger. From a boiling up place. The only reason you and I boil up is because we don't speak up when it was time. We left it too long. And it says in James 3.16, it says where there's jealousy, where there's strife, 
This word jealousy simply means to boil over. You ever boil over? If I speak the word of God from a boiled over position, what I'm allowing is not grace to flow, but every evil work to come into manifestation. And as the church, I got to understand this. For where there's envy, this word envy, jealousy, it's this word that in the Greek simply means to be to boil over. So it's this word like that you would be passionate and fired, but it's either used good or it's used bad. It's you're boiling over with fervor, like ha. Ah. But when something is boiled over, and it's out of frustration instead of love. What happens is I'm partnering with the enemy to bring about his works. Guys, it's time that we speak the truth in love. We speak it honestly. We speak it timely. How many of you know speaking the truth at the wrong time does not administer grace? Holy Spirit, teach me. Remind me. Show me how to carry a message that is good news. Let our world, our world be shaped by your word instead of a culture. Let, let a transforming take place. What, he, what Paul said, because there wasn't a word of culture at the time, he said, uh, be not conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Did you know that our lives can begin to change from one degree of glory or manifestation of God's goodness to the next, to the next, to the next? It's simply as we behold his word as we place it up high above another word, if we, as we bring our, uh, the things that are speaking, all the, well, who's breathing on you? Who's breathing on you? And we bring God's breath, God's spirit, God's word uh, in and out of our mouths into the situation. We no longer let another word stand. We say, this is what you said, Lord. And I begin to raise my voice. And I, and I use my voice and I give others a choice of simply what God has for them. Guys, when I'm speaking on today, I'm going to close with this verse. 1 Timothy 4.16. Pay close attention to your life, to your teaching. What do you say? What are you passing on? This is uh, Paul talking to Timothy. The King James says, your doctrine, what you believe. He says, pay close attention and persevere in them. For doing so, you will save both yourself and the hearer. If we're not persevering in what we believe, guys, we're on a tube going with the flow. If we're not persevering, if it's not, uh, it doesn't have to cause you to take a stand because you really wish you could do that, you really wish you could watch that, and you really wish that, and, and, and all these things, they, sin, the Bible says, is pleasurable for a season, but the end leads to destruction. Guys, we can have heaven on earth, or we can have what earth offers that is so temporal and is never fulfilling. It only gratifies lust. And the, the root of lust is more. Got to have more. Got to have more. The thing about more is it can't be satisfied. Oh, but the love of God satisfies. So, I want to close this morning fully by receiving communion. You know, we read in 1 John 4, 4, or 1 through 4, it says that every spirit that declares Jesus has come in the flesh, that declared him as Lord, that speaks that, it says that that is from the Lord. And you know, the, the, the process of, of, of having God work in our life is simply, it starts at when we declare he is Lord. Not just that he's Savior, not just the, about, but that he's our Lord, that we're taking our cues from him. When we make that proclamation that Jesus is Lord, what happens is we position ourselves for God's power, God's grace, God's work. Listen, 
a word to stand. I come underneath of it, and that word can stand. And the, the, the word that he speaks, the, the, his plans and his desires for my life are now able to come forward. My putting him in that place, me calling him Lord, me surrendering myself is, is the key to seeing my life. And listen, when I miss it, and, and, and I missed it, I just need to agree with what he says. I need to agree with what he says. What do, you, what do you believe? What do you believe? Who said it? Why do you believe it? Is it culture or is it the word? Go back to the word. For us to say today in our 18, 60, 70, 80 years of what's relevant and what's not or what's truth and what's not, compared to a word that's alive, that, that it, a book that was written by God, uh, and, and you see prophecies fulfilled, 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 and this, he said, this is the word that's spoken and it will remain. For us to all of a sudden say in our enlightenment, in our 18, 15, 20, 30, 60 years, we're deceived. Any revelation that has its foundation apart from the word of God is deception. Any revelation. Listen, a lot of times, we're getting revelations about other people. But God didn't speak it to you because he covers. Love covers. Any revelation apart from the word of God is deception. But I wanted to close this morning by receiving uh, communion and making this declaration. I think mine fell on the ground somewhere. You know, let's stand this morning. You know, <laughs> my whole prayer this morning and this week coming into this message is, but let me speak in love. Because it was your love that set me free. You know, when we're not truthful about where we're at, we only strengthen um, the lie that holds us. Listen, when we come into church, if we're going to present the truth, let's at least walk in the truth. If, if, we're, if we're struggling and we're messed up and we're this, let's not put on a faith face. A fake face is, would be a better word for that. But let's be truthful. Let's honor the Lord by and let the, the, the truth work by simply being open and honest with the Lord. And if you need, if you, and if you're in a place where, man, the, the you've been being chewed up and spit out, and I mean, you don't even know what bed you woke up in this morning, and you ended up coming to church because the Lord wanted you here, and He's and you He was loving on you, and He said, "I just gotta come." That's okay, because He loves you, and He's. But you got to agree with what he says, that that's not okay. But his love for you, because what happens is, is when you're convicted, you reach out for the one that can justify. Jesus justifies through lordship. Do you have Jesus as your Lord? Do you have Jesus as your Lord? Just with your head bowed and your eyes closed, not, not to not talk to other people, but I want you just to take inventory this morning of your heart. Do you hold Jesus as Lord? Is he the one that's talking to you and setting your days? Are you, or are you, Lord? Man, I, I know in my heart, it, there's just, just this, this whole, there's a morning of opportunity to re- seat Christ above our homes our families our lives and I just want to do that this morning thank you Lord Lord, thank you. You're so good to speak the truth to us, to love us. 
to be patient and kind with us. But I always appoint us to the way of salvation. Not of our works, but of Christ. Who was the Word? Your very Word that became flesh and dwelt among us. Today I'm just going to ask you if you feel the Lord tugging at your heart that you need to put Him back in that place as Lord. I want you just to lift your hands to the Lord. Just you can lift them beside. You can lift them, and you can. We're just. This is between you and the Lord. And you're saying this, God. I want, and today I choose to put you in the place as Lord and ruler of my heart and my life. Just pray this prayer with me. If that's you, or if you've never given your heart to Christ, this is a great, uh, just a wonderful time to give. Maybe you're online and you just got to give your, you got to, you feel like the Lord's drawing you to come to Him. We come to Him with, with our hearts and we express our hearts with our words. The Bible says you believe in your heart and you speak with your mouth. But just pray this with me. Say, Father, today I surrender all of my life to your Lordship. I surrender my life to your Son, Jesus, that you gave to pay a price for my sins, a price I couldn't pay. Jesus paid by dying on the cross through his death. I believe he did not stay dead, but he rose from the dead to make a payment for me. Today, Jesus, I declare as my Lord, Lord of my family. Lord of my marriage, Lord of my finances, Lord of my life. If you'll put up 1 Corinthians 11, I want you to see this. It's the very last scripture in my notes. It says, for I, this is Paul talking, he says, for I've received from the Lord what I also pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, that he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. And he says, receive it in remembrance of me. We're not doing that yet. Receive it in remembrance of me. Next verse. In the same way, after supper, he also took a cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant, a new agreement in my blood. He said, do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink of this cup, You proclaim Jesus is Lord until he comes. Guys, this is something that can't wait for church. This is something in the home that every time you receive, I mean, you sit down and you receive and see, receive a meal. It'd be great for us to sit down and receive a meal and and, and appropriate the blood or declare the, the, the body and the blood of Jesus. Listen, this body was broken. It was beaten because of our sins. Listen, the blood of Jesus that was shed for us is our righteousness. This is what positions me in him with favor. And so just right now with, the, with, this, with this bread, Father, we thank you for your body that was broken for us. And that by your stripes, if you need healing in your body, I thank you. You said that your word was sent forth and it healed people. Father, I thank you that even at the, the word that was spoken this morning and this reading of scripture, healing was taking place in bodies. But we receive right now your body broken for us. We declare Jesus is Lord over our bodies. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for that. Your body that was broken for us. Or not broken, but beaten. And Father, we thank you for the blood that was shed for our sins. For our forgiveness. For our cleansing. For payment. Past, present, and future. Father, thank you that it's made a way that we can always come. No matter where we're at. 
matter what we've done, we today declare Jesus is Lord of our lives because of the blood. And we receive it in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, for your goodness, your patience with us, your loving kindness that's causing us to repent or to change the way that we think. Thank you for your loving kindness and your goodness. And we honor you. And we just receive your word, everything you've spoken to us. And I just plead the blood of Jesus over. I thank you there's no weapon or uh, formed against that word or a manipulation of it that would be heard in a heart or in a mind today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, God bless you guys so much. And um, we'll see you guys Wednesday night for church. Grab those kiddos.